Good morning, Revolution, everybody. Welcome to our program this morning. There's been a lot to talk about this week, including in New Hampshire, that great <laughs> bastion of liberalism. They took down a marker honoring our wonderful chairperson, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. They were going to shoot way down south to Florida, where Mr. DeSantis is running far to the right following the playground of uh, Richard Nixon, or was it Reagan? I forget which one of them. Uh, and then the GOP generally is hammering on so-called cultural issues, but really what they're doing is attacking democracy. <clears throat> and then there was a big election. We're going to shoot back over to Florida, Jacksonville, I think it is. Donna Deegan won an important election. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. But first, who's afraid of Elizabeth Gurley Flynn? And why? Rosanna, good morning. Well, they're afraid for many reasons. First of all, she was a woman who was active even in her teens. So um, that is a scary thing for a lot of youth who are looking for alternatives. She was a communist. And uh, she stands for for the rights of women as well as for the rights of working people. Well said, well said. Anita, why are they so afraid of Elizabeth? I don't know. Uh, they're really they really seem to be um, afraid of her. Uh, and they're really, it's it's ironic because she was a, a not only the the chairperson of the Communist Party but also the founder of the American uh, Civil Liberties Union. So she really really uh, focused on people's freedoms and freedom to um, to to you know interpret history. For example, uh, it's it's just um, it, it reminds me of the audience, uh, the New Hampshire audience that we had seen just last week. With the CNN, uh, you know, debacle with uh, Donald Trump, uh, there's evidently uh, some some very emboldened uh, Republicans in New Hampshire who think that that they can get away with, uh, you know, imposing their version of history and just erasing uh, history. Uh, it's she's an inspiration to all people, not just young women, but all people, um, and uh, we she deserves to be. Uh, recognized uh in her hometown scott the gop yeah, I, complains okay. about cancel culture it's <laughs> now trying to cancel robert e lee they're trying to cancel this one they're trying to can you want to take down the statue of samuel adams george washington they're calling them all slave owners they're intolerant what the hell are they doing in New Hampshire? Well, you know, it's no surprise, really, that the 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 fascist forces would be, um, you know, brandishing the slogan of, of of you know freedom, but what they actually mean is freedom for them and uh, you know subjugation for everybody else. Uh, it's cancel culture when we do it to them, but it's you know their freedom when they're uh, taking down this monument to. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. And I think, um, you know, kind of following on what Anita said, the reason people are so scared, the reason um, freedom haters and fascists and conservatives are so scared of her is precisely because uh, she <laughs> flies in the face of this, this narrative that communism is oppressive and undemocratic and, you know, opposed to liberty. She was one of the great fighters uh, for political liberty, for civil liberties in our country, and also a great organizer of the working class and a great fighter for socialism. She really exemplifies kind of that. Uh, and, and, and I think that's why it, it's such a challenge to, to the anti-communism of, of the capitalist class. She was a leader of the 19, what is it, 12 textile strike in Lawrence, mm -hmm. Massachusetts. She is credited with one of the 100 greatest speeches of the 20th century. You know where that was given? Mm -hmm. At her Smith Act trial. She was put on trial along with 
Bill Foster and Ben Davis and all the rest for thinking Marxist thoughts. That was the charge, believe it or not, conspiring to think to overthrow the established government of the United States. And uh, Democrats and Republicans alike supported that. And the very good civil libertarians in the ACLU, listen to this, Rosanna, they kicked her off the board. Kicked her off mm. the board of the ACLU. This courageous, uh, brave, intelligent leader of our working class. And not my question is, what are we going to do about it? I think we need to write uh, to the governor of New Hampshire to because first of all, they legally took it down. They just went in and destroyed it without going through the process. They have an actual procedure and they didn't follow it. Um, that I think is an infringement of people's rights. The other thing is I think uh, we should all be writing op-eds to our different newspapers in all our areas to protesting these kinds of actions as a way of silencing free speech and uh, show our support for those who really fought for this country in a way that it was very, you know, sacrificed her life and um, for the working people. I agree. Very, we have to protest this loudly, you know, including, I don't know, we got members up in New Hampshire, we got to mobilize them and in adjoining states. In fact, we have to mobilize the country. We should do a, a national petition demanding that uh, she be honored and that that plaque, there it is in the corner, the rebel girl, be restored. Um, we can't, if we don't fight for our history, who will? Hmm. Nobody else is going to fight for it if we don't fight for it. I mean, come on. Uh, Elizabeth was the national chairperson of the Communist Party. That was her last honored political title. And we had to fight for her legacy. She's gone, but her spirit lives on. And uh, so uh, we're going to get back to you next week on what we've done in order to fight for Elizabeth's justly deserved honor. Because <clears throat> you can talk about the fight against male supremacy and sexism all you want, but when a sexist, anti-communist act like this is committed and you do nothing, then it's just talk, Scott. It, it, it's just a bunch of talk. And one of the things we're going to point out at the National Committee meeting is that male supremacy is one of the key uh, central uh, foundation stones of the new GOP fascist offensive. You know, there are three prongs to it. Racism, anti-communism, and male supremacy, you know? And uh, if we don't address it, I don't know who will. Speaking of male supremacy, <laughs> DeSantis lost a big election. Look at that mouth. <laughs> you know, it's a great picture. <laughs> I'm not going to say the next thing I was thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but it needs to be closed. Talk mm -hmm. about canceling. <laughs> uh, DeSantis lost a big election, uh, Anita, in Florida to Donna Deegan, um, who, who, who uh, comes from a political family. I understand her uncle was a former uh, mayor. Hmm. And um, uh, in a state that is supposed to be a red state, and DeSantis just went after Trump saying that, I was listening to the news this morning, 
telling Republican donors, oh, Trump can't win. We're on a losing streak. I'm the one who can defeat the Democratic opponent. I'm your guy. And 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 then he lost in, in Jacksonville, <laughs> which was one of those 15 largest cities in the country and is a place where DeSantis won easily when he ran for office. Now, I know you spend time in Florida. What is going on here? Oh, and is this question for me? This must question, question must be for you. me because I've spent time in Florida. And uh, he's also removed, I mean, uh, Disney has, has decided to pull out a $1 billion project that they had started in Florida uh, because of that, that backlash. But yeah, Donna Deegan's um, opponent outspent her by like a multiple of five or something. I think he spent five times more than she did on this uh, on this election. Um, and Jacksonville has always been the, one of the most conservative uh, cities in Florida, kind of like the Panhandle. It's on the Atlantic, but it's um it's a very conservative area. Um, and this is just a brilliant. Uh, uh, victory on the part of Donna Deegan. It's really exciting for Jacksonville and for the for the uh, Democratic Party of Florida, which uh, people have um, said is uh, well. Ron DeSantis said it was like a a dead thing on the side of the road, and and Nikki Freed replied, "Well, your your presidential campaign is a dead thing on the side of the road." So I think dead things on the side of the road is something that Floridians are are familiar with. So uh, it's an apt metaphor for DeSantis's presidential campaign. Scott, now that we're engaging in something what our ultra left detractors call tailing the Democratic Party, <laughs> can, you, can, can you tell me uh, why this election was important and why in an off election year, which are generally favored by the Republicans, generally their voters come out more in in off elections than do their opponents. Uh, why, why was this so important? Well, it's important because um, it shows that um, democratic forces, as you say, Joe, small D democratic forces um, can come out and organize and win elections, even in a um, supposedly, you know, steadfastly conservative uh, region. Um, and it shows us that there's, you know, that there is a path forward, that it's possible to um, fight the GOP on the local level and and win, even in, you know, even in these deep red areas. Um, so it's it's very inspiring. And um, I think it's, you know, it's something that needs to happen everywhere because the GOP has been very, very good at, um, you know, building power in local elections, everything from school boards to um, mayors, city councils, uh, state legislatures, and uh, we, uh, the very broad, we have to start um, contesting that and, and beating it back. And Rosanna, this was part of a general trend that's happening around the country. First in Chicago with the police uh, control uh, board election. I don't think they use the word control, but that's what they mean. Um, and then the election in Wisconsin of the state Supreme Court judge who beat her Republican opponent by 10 points. I mean, that's what you call beating the pants off of him. Pardon the picture that I just painted in your mind. And, and, and then in Colorado Springs, a progressive uh, independent one you had good results in Philadelphia um, and, and now Florida. So something's happening in the country and the general electorate is saying no to fascist minded politics. That's something that can be built on Rosanna, don't you think? Most definitely, I think it's you know indication that people are understanding the power uh, through the ballot box and through uh, voicing their opposition to this fascist attempt to take over our country. So I'm I'm very very hopeful. 
And that hope has to be matched by organized uh, political action on the ground. Because, um, you know, uh, you can't uh, win on air. And you can't win on wishful, it has to be organized. And that sentiment has to be uh, made material, you know, by money, by door to door work, by talking to people, by get out to vote campaigns, by protests, by demonstrations, by strikes, and so on and so forth. By the way, we want to reiterate our support for the striking uh, Hollywood writers who are still out, still fighting for a living wage because the, 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 the Republicans are focusing on what they call cultural issues, but it really don't have much to do with culture. It has everything, and I mean everything to do with democracy. Do you know, Anita, that the Republicans have hmm. passed, no, nah, they haven't passed, they have placed 497 bills attacking trans people since January in 49 states. Hmm. In Oklahoma, they got a, a, a bill uh, extending uh, uh, opposed to extending gender affirming care well into adulthood, up to 26. They want to ban it, 26 years old. In Florida, once again, don't say gay. In Arizona, they want teachers to report bills that promote gender fluidity and gender pronoun, and the list goes on and on and on. And then there are the drag bands. You know, they want to say drag shows, uh, adult porno businesses, and so on and so forth. And I'm sure there's some of that. As a fact, I know that there's some of that going on in Ohio, Anita. Yes, there is. There is definitely. We've had, uh, in fact, Nazi uh, Nazis showing up at drag shows that are really designed for, you know, drag uh reading events and libraries and the most innocuous uh, programs, um, they have been showing up in force with their uniforms and their faces covered. It's, it's really frightening. They've tried to intimidate people. Um, but actually in Cleveland uh, recently, uh, the comrades made a line and they sang a happy song and, and drowned out the, uh, the, the anti-trans uh, protesters. But I think the GOP has really hooked onto this trans issue because it's a distraction. They're not doing anything uh, to um, help human needs. They're not uh, addressing affordable housing. They're not addressing uh, the, 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 the crises of, of uh, poor, the poverty that people are still experiencing and more now that the child tax credit has been uh, gone by the wayside. So uh, they really want to distract uh, us from these uh, real crucial issues about our working lives and our conditions um, of living by, you know, uh, distracting their voters with this uh, anti-trans uh, stuff that they just can't mind their own business. That's what I want Republicans to do. Just, you know, let people do what they want to do and just let them mind, I mean, have them mind their own business um, there. Scott, I was watching an interview with Anita's former governor and next door neighbor, Don Kasich. And uh, <laughs> former governor, next door neighbor, Ace Boom Coon, <laughs> Don <laughs> Kasich. And he said something very interesting. He said, but the, the, the interviewer said, you know, in, in, in a, a red state like Ohio, and Kasich said, yo, wait a minute now. I'm not so sure Ohio's a red state. Mm -hmm. He said that Trump, one Ohio, but the people of Ohio were upset. The working, the workers were upset 
by some of the things that the Democrats were doing around economic questions. And he said, that don't necessarily mean that that's going to live forever. Places like where I'm from, Youngstown, Warren, Cleveland, you know? And I would imagine that the same thing might be true in Florida, that it depends on platform and issues uh, and whether or not workers feel that the opposition party or the leading party, depending on how you look at it, is putting forward uh, solutions to the problems that they face. And the problems are immense, Scott. Yeah, uh, you know, th this, it's a, it's a really critical moment because, you know, the, the, the Biden administration has, you know, m achieved some uh, advances in terms of combating the, the pandemic, um, the infrastructure bill, some investments in sustainability, but so much of, uh, of the rhetoric and, and the promises have, have not materialized. And, you know, this is not just that, that Joe Biden personally doesn't want it or whatever. It's, you know, there's um, 50, what, 50, 49 Republicans and um, two rogue uh, pseudo Democrats in the Senate that block everything and, you know, the House of Representatives shifted to the right, all that. Um, but there needs to be, people need to be, need to see that they're, the people that claim to represent them are fighting for them and they need to be uh, brought into that fight um, and not told, you know, show up uh, once every couple of years and, and check the, you know, the box with the D on it and then, and then go home and, you know, watch prices rise and, you know, the situation get harder. It, it, so, but on the other hand, we're not going to have the, the leverage to make those economic changes without um, fighting in those democratic struggles uh, for trans rights, for um, uh, gay rights, uh, you know, against white supremacy, against male supremacy. All of those are part of building the kind of power that we need to to win something better for everyone. I want to do a lightning round. Remember the lightning rounds we used to do? We haven't done one in several several weeks, several months, actually. And the lightning round is this. What, what is primary? Fight against fascism? Or fight for democracy? Because does, does the fight against fascism trump the class struggle? Or does the class struggle trump the fight against, pardon that word, Trump. Yeah, fight stop saying Trump. Fascism. <laughs> what's primary, what's secondary? Anita. I, I'm sorry. I think they're inextricable. I, I really think the fight against fascism involves the fight for democracy because the working class is the vast majority of our, our society. And we want that working class to have its it's it's a uh, voice heard and it's and it's will be done and that would defeat fascism. So I think they're inextricable. Inextricable. Anita takes the middle road. Rosanna. <laughs> Fight well, against I, fascism or the class struggle? I'm with Anita. <laughs> <laughs> Although I'm not clear about the word in, in, uh, that she used, but I, I get a, the gist of it. it. It's one and the same. It's you can't fight against fascism without fighting for the right, you know, for democracy. So there, I guess one is looking at it in a positive direction and the other one is looking at it like gloom and doom. I don't know. Depends <laughs> on what side of the bottle you're looking at. Is it half full or half? Scott, right. what's primary? The oh. last struggle or the fight against fascism? The, 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 the primary contradiction, right, is the, um, the uh, relations of production versus the forces of production. So that the class struggle uh, in some, uh, in a very deep way is the, the, the primary, the expression of the primary uh, contradiction under capitalism. But right now, the fight against fascism is the, um, it's the terrain, the main terrain of the class struggle. Um, the fight, uh, the, the fight against fascism, the fight for democracy is the main task of the working class right now. 
because we can't move forward to bigger and better things, to an anti-monopoly coalition, to socialism, uh, eventually, you know, to socialist revolution, um, if we have, yeah, if, if the working class, first of all, is divided and partially under the influence of fascist forces, and if, you know, fascist forces are, are you know, in, in partial control of our society. It's, it's, you know, the fight against fascism is the terrain of, of, of the class struggle right now. The class struggle. So all of you are saying, and Joe, stop with this false positing, posing <laughs> of the question. You're, you're, you're doing it in an undialectical way. <laughs> that these issues, class and interpenetrate, <clears throat> of course, objectively, on the realm of, of broad theory, class trumps everything. But in reality, Sorry, those issues that. interpenetrate, you know, it, uh, class and, 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 and democracy, class and race, class and gender, and so on and so forth. And, and so, but you find people <clears throat> continually on the left from various, for various different reasons, Count, juxtapose and counter and counterpose these uh, these uh, uh, questions, and so they'll say things like the main contradiction is this: fascism versus bourgeois democracy. <laughs> or, on the other hand, why do y'all keep focusing on these identity politics, these democratic issues? What we need to struggle on is class, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> class trumps everything you know we'll deal with the race issues the gender issues we'll deal with that later now nah, you got to deal with it now or you'll never deal with it you know because you got to build unity in the course of struggle on the ground point of production in the factories in the streets on the campuses i mean so I think you are right. I shouldn't have posed the question that way, but it was fun. And I enjoyed <laughs> it. <laughs> Mailbag question. Let's deal with that. Do you or do you not <laughs> denounce your blind support given to the Soviet Union? Who wants to go first? Any takers? I'll take it, Joe. Okay. It, remi it reminds me, I just read Ch China Mievel's book about the uh, Communist Manifesto. And he's a he's sort of a socialist type uh, um, a dilettante politically from the UK um, and uh, not very clear on some political things. He wrote a lovely book about the Communist Manifesto, but he sort of dismissed the Soviet Union in, in a paragraph or two in a you know, in his big book, people are just, people want to take the, the, the history of the Soviet Union and put it in a little box and, and set it aside. I think we really need to grapple with the nuances of, um, of the so socialist experiment that uh, the Soviet Union undertook for, for all those years. I mean, it, it wasn't just one thing. It wasn't, it, 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 people oversimplify it all the time. So I think um, I I think we were right to give support to some as to most aspects or to the to to the gist of of a socialist experiment. And I would say I'm not denouncing my support. I'm not saying I I want to bring it back exactly the way it was. But I think we shouldn't be um, ashamed of of recognizing that it was an experiment in socialism, and they you know there were some very uh, um, aspects of it that deserve to be uh, treated seriously. China Melville, he's a good writer. Fantasy, horror, fantasy, horror. Mm -hmm. I, I like you his, uh, he uses all them big words. Yeah, you need a dictionary to get through it. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think he comes out of the Trotsky tradition in the UK though, which might explain that paragraph and the thing he wrote. For mm -hmm. the, I believe that was first in the New York Times around one of the anniversaries of the manifesto. Anybody else? 
Do you support or denounce I, USSR, I, Scott? I celebrate and, and continue to celebrate the, the, the great victory um, that the founding of the Soviet Union and it's, you know, building building itself into the, the first socialist superpower represents. You know, I celebrate the heroic sacrifices of the Soviet people in the, the combat against fascism. Um, and I think our party was absolutely right um, to uh, support the Soviet Union, to defend it, um, to point out consistently that the people of the Soviet Union were trying to do something um, groundbreaking, something, something new, uh, and they were attacked by capitalist forces at every moment on every side. Um, does that mean Soviet socialism was perfect? No, um, but uh, it was, you know, it's not the, you know, people imagine it as this, you know, basically a, a, a gulag with a huge statue of Stalin towering over it. And that's just, it's a bourgeois fabrication designed to discredit um, socialism and discredit communism and we we should reject it utterly you know what i denounce scott i i, I denounce that mop of curly hair you have on your <laughs> head That's what I, <laughs> down with the curly i mean come on it's not fair <laughs> oh, them curls redistribution of hair <laughs> on that young man's head i mean Joe. Rosanna, you, you want to take a shot at it? Do you denounce or support you? Today? <laughs> I want to take a shot at the question, actually. Um, I think, you know, we were raised in this country to think that everything has to be one or the other, black and white. It's, you know, there's no in between. And that's a wrong way of looking at things. We as communists and as Marxist dialecticians, whatever you want to use, we look at the whole picture, we look, analyze it, it's good parts, it's valuable, what's valuable, what's not valuable, what worked, what didn't work. And then we make a decision based on that. And so what both Anita and, uh, uh, <laughs> I forgot, sorry, <laughs> your name is on the top of my head, but I can't, <laughs> Scott, what both, <laughs> what both have said is true. And so, you know, and they both outlined it as the good and the bad and, and the different things. So I think that we need to get into the practice of not looking for that one particular straight answer that defines everything. It's not that way. Life is not that way. And uh, it, we have to move away from that idea that it has to be one or the other. No, it's, it's a combination of things. And um, and it's the way that we should look at life, not just on a political level, but even on a personal level. There's always that good element. There's always what to learn, what you didn't learn, and how do you move forward? I, Joe Sims Jr., will never denounce my support for socialism, ever. I die and go to hell before I denounce it. In the Soviet Union, in China, in Cuba, anywhere they are attempting to build it with all of its positives and also the negative. You know, Lenin once said that you can't use a bourgeois standard to judge socialism. You gotta use a working class standard. <clears throat> and I always thought, about my dad and my mom and my grandma and my grandfather. What would happen if they were suddenly handed the realm of power, the kingdom of power? What, what, what would they do? And what kinds of positive and what kinds of mistakes would they make, you know? Hmm. And that's the framework from which we have to judge a country which, which broke free of imperialism was the weakest link, had a big population, huge, most of whom were illiterate, <clears throat> and their attempt to uh, build a new society. Yeah, they made mistakes. 
um, and we're going to continue to make mistakes. We don't have 500 years of ruling class power like the bourgeoisie in this country and around the world. No, we have, they had a 75, 80, 90 years, you know, give us 500, we'll, we'll, we will, and, we'll, and we will have it, make no mistake, give us 500 year, half a millennium of uh, ruling class, of, uh, of that knowledge, you know. Uh, nobody wrote, Machiavelli wrote The Prince in order to, not for the people who were ruling then, but for future uh, classes that would come to power. We had no prince, you know, but we have one now. And that, that, that book is the accumulated knowledge of the communist and workers' parties. One thing I think we can be critical of, though, is tying our kite too tightly to developments that were taking a place in the U.S. because we thought that it was the model and we weren't alone. Many other parties did and we emulated that. And that's why Gus and Winston and the others decided we need to develop our own model and we call our own model Bill of Rights Socialism in these United States. We have to continue to develop it and embellish it and think about how we will rule according to what took place in this country. Well, that does it, I think, for this week. Thank you for listening. Until next week, stay strong. Stay safe and uh, and stay in the fight. And by the way, the Marxist school starts this week. Tomorrow is it? Start, Anita, mm -hmm. Rosanna. Yep, tomorrow. You go to CPU. You want to learn about Marxism, Leninism. You want to learn about creative science of the working class and intelligentsia and students and youth. Check us out. We have two week, three weeks of classes on a whole number of different subjects. You go to cpusa.org. And, and it don't cost you nothing but a little bit of knowledge. And you can afford that. In fact, you you can't not afford to take it to take those classes. Anyway, <laughs> take care, stay strong, stay safe. We'll see you next week. Have a good weekend, everybody. And say gay. Bye. Bye.